So you've been investing for a month, feel comfortable with the way stock prices rise and fall, and think that you've got a grasp on this whole valuation thing. You look at the PER for every stock, you read the news, and compare market caps and ROEs amongst industry competitors. You check the share price, you check the book values, you check the book values per share to make sure you're getting more than what you're paid for. Easy, right? Well, as anything, there's always space to improve, and today, that's what we're going to try to help you with. You're watching Sekider, and today we'll be talking about some helpful stats to help narrow down your value picks. Now before we continue, I'd like to ask that you do us a solid, scroll down, like and subscribe to the channel, and keep up with the content that we put out in the future. Otherwise, we just like to remind you that this channel is meant for educational purposes only and isn't meant to replace legal or financial advice from a paid professional. All of the information provided is already available in texts for free across the internet, whether they be about specific stocks or about how to select stocks for your portfolio. We're just trying to bring it here together to save you a little bit of time. Also, I don't know if I say this enough, but no mention of any company on this channel is meant to be an advertisement for it. Do your own research and let us help you along the way. Now let's get to it. Alright, so as I said before, today we'll be talking about a few metrics that you may see when looking at your brokerage app. Let me show you what I'm talking about by picking a random company that I've never heard of and pulling up their stats. Alright, so a company that the robo-advisor is recommending right now is Yongbo Pahak, Yongbo Chemicals. To get the stats, I just click on Hyunjega. This will pull up the records for today's trading stats, including the final bid and ask prices, as well as its daily performance and total volume. We don't care about that stuff, so we scroll down to Jongmok Sangse, and it's a tab that gives us more information that'll help us decide whether or not this is a company that we want to invest in going forward. Obviously, there's more to it than this, but these stats are a really good place to start just to get some basic ideas about where a company is and where it stands. Now, your apps may be different from mine, but I suspect that every app has a similar page to this, given that these are very basic but very important numbers that can immediately turn you on or off a company. Looking at the current page, we see that they have some numbers that we've gone over before. You got the price to earnings, or how much you're paying for how much they're making, price to book value, or how much you're paying for how much the company is tangibly worth, you have earnings per share, and book value per share, or how much each share is worth both in earnings and in assets. And finally, it's recent performance in terms of highs and lows for the periods consisting of a year, four business weeks, and five business days. Dividend stuff is included at the bottom, as well as target prices set by analysts if you scroll a bit down. Now we've talked in other episodes about how to use those stats to better read a stock and screen them for safety, but there are a couple others that deserve recognition that are listed on this page, namely the components of this statistic, the EV to EBITDA measurement. Before talking about what this ratio aims to do, let's break down its component parts starting with EV. The letters E and V stand for Enterprise Value, and it's one of the best ways of identifying how much you'll be paying for a company in its entirety. Now there are two other measurements that aim to get the value of a company, which we've spoken about before, book value, as well as market cap. So how does EV differ? Well, book value uses the simple measurement of assets minus liabilities and the market cap measures a total company's total equity by multiplying its number of outstanding shares to the price of each share. EV attempts to measure the totality of the company's value by including both equity and debt capital to the total price of a company. This is because theoretically the total price of acquiring a company should necessarily include the company's debts because any new shareholders or any owner would be responsible for paying for those debts in the future. Now, as usual, I realize that those are all a bunch of words thrown together in such a way that most people out here probably don't understand what they mean, so let's break it down in terms of formula with an example. Now, EV is calculated by adding equity, or market cap, to debt capital, and subtracting the company's total cash, since the cash could technically be used to pay off debts. So let's use two fake companies we've talked about here before, Shumart and Big Hot Bread Entertainment. Now, let's assume that both companies have the same market cap, that is to say, the value of all of their shares combined reaches the same amount of 500 billion won. Now maybe Shumart has a great looking balance sheet and has paid off all but 10 billion won of debt. Their management has also taken care of their cash flows and they have a cash reserve of about 100 billion won. Plug the numbers into the formula and Shumart's enterprise value boils down to 410 billion won. On the other hand, 
Big Hot Bread has taken out a lot of debt in recent years to finance their world domination plans, coming to an amount of 150 billion won in debt, and their cash reserves only count for about 100 billion won at present. This makes their enterprise value 550 billion won. Now when we compare them side to side, we can see that Schumart is much less expensive than BHP at the current time. But wait, isn't that similar to book value? Not really. Because the thing is, enterprise value is a bit of a misleading title for what we're actually talking about. Book value is how much the company would be worth if it were to go out of business, liquidate assets, pay off debt, and pay out the net to its current shareholders. Comparatively, enterprise value is a total price that somebody would be paying if they were to theoretically purchase the entire company and continue to run it as is, because debt would then become the responsibility of the company owner and should therefore be considered an additional acquisition cost. Thus, EV serves a different purpose from book value, since assets minus liabilities tells you how much is tangibly there, whereas EV tells you how much you would have to pay for what's there. Does that make sense? Book value is tangible value, whereas enterprise value is cost. Now, let's break down the equation into its bare parts because we can now see that a company that has more debt than cash will have a higher EV than its market cap, whereas a company with more cash than debt will have a lower market cap. Now, for some value investors, low EVs may appear to be a better investment since they're clearly paying a lower price at the time of purchase. However, that ain't it, Boko. In its pure form, the value of a security at any time is the total of all of their future cash flows discounted back to the present price. Thus, if BHB far outstrips Schumart in growing its operations and cash flows in the future, then the premium you paid would be well worth the higher price. Perhaps Schumart is able to have such low debt because it hasn't been spending or expanding much as its growth goals are much smaller than those of BHB whose aims are world domination and has to spend a lot of money and has been spending a lot of money over the past few years on things like asset acquisition, maybe mergers, other company acquisitions, you know, that type of thing. Now, EV and book value tell you price and value at the current moment in time. So if we actually want to make these stats useful, we have to use a little ratio that we referenced before, the EV to EBITDA, which means we need to understand what the EBITDA is. All right, now, EBITDA stands for Earnings Before Interest, Taxes, Depreciation, and Amortization. And as the name clearly states, it aims to measure the totality of a company's earnings. But we already have earnings, whined the bullies who torment me in the back of my head. Well, yes, net earnings are a thing. But the biggest problem with net earnings is that it doesn't provide a full view of how much a company actually earned because it minuses things like taxes, depreciation, and amortization. And these are just words, but essentially. Revenue or top line earnings are really helpful for telling us whether or not a company has gained or lost money overall within a specific range of dates, as well as how much they've gained or lost. Comparatively, EBITDA is earnings in its most natural form because corporate taxes, interest rates on loans, depreciation, and amortization of assets can differ between companies and make a company with greater earnings and greater earnings growth than its competitors look understated due to those particular factors. So there you have it. EV is the total price you're paying for an asset, and EBITDA is the total amount of earnings that a company is making in its rawest form. So let's go back to the start. EV to EBITDA. What is it for, and why is it held to the same regard as PER and PBR? Well, PER tells you how much investors are currently willing to pay for a company on an earnings basis. PBR does the same on a book value basis. Both of these considerations are made without considering the stock as more than a stock. The P in those ratios refer specifically to the individual stock prices, and we know that stock prices are fickle because they're all based on consumer attitude. But the EV to EBITDA ratio follows through where the PER falls short in that it actually takes into consideration the entirety of the business itself. So while PE ratios can't really tell you much about the cost of acquiring a company that's net losing money, EV to EBITDA technically could, and that's what's great about this ratio. Now in practical use, EV to EBITDA could be a good way of thinking about how long it would take a company to repay its purchase price. So let's once again look at Schumart and BHB. We look at the EBITDA for both of these companies and see that Schumart's yearly earnings add up to about 50 billion won. This makes their EV to EBITDA roughly 8.2. That means that it should technically be able to pay off its purchase price in about 8.2 years. Now we look over at BHB and see that they're making, say, 80 billion per year. 
That puts them at a ratio of 6.87, meaning that it would take you about a year and a bit less time to make back the cost of the acquisition. So, even though BHB's total price tag, aka its enterprise value, is higher than that of Shoemart's, you're getting a lot more value over time. Thus, value investors who have the future in mind will recognize that it actually does have quite a bit of value regardless of the height of its price tag. That being said, an EV to EBITDA that's lower is better than one that is higher, and anyone using this stat when actually looking at the value of a company should do what they do with PER and PBR and compare the company's EV to EBITDA to that of its industries. Now, of course we know that the past nor the present dictate the future, and these numbers change. Right? They're not going to be consistent all the time. The EBITDA and the EV are not going to remain the same on a quarter to quarter basis. And neither this nor any other stat is a crystal ball, so using it as if it were one could, of course, lead to extreme dissatisfaction with the stock if earnings and market cap drop over time due to things like macro trends or black swan events or mismanagement. This is why stock picking is actually quite hard. You have to be wary and avoid using one statistic or two statistics or just three statistics in general to base your entire valuations on. Still, this is a very useful stat to use when comparing a company to its competition. All right, pray your hands to the gods that this video has helped illuminate how this stat can help you in your search for good investment opportunities because that was, that was a big one. Now we'll be back in a couple days with what we're watching, but otherwise we hope to see you in the future. Good luck with your investments and we'll see you in a bit. Take it easy.